As I told you at the beginning, um, the, um, uh, my presentation will focus on uh, dissection, but it won't be only a dissection, it would be practically a discussion on how uh, um, the anatomy will, will be important for, for, the, for surgery and for uh, the surgical techniques. So I will also focus on the indications of some surgical techniques and we will discuss even on how uh, what is supposed to be uh, a new new surgical indication are really uh, effective or, or not. Um, so you know that the temporal bone it's a complex bone because it's uh, formed by three parts. So you have the squamous part, the tympanic part, and also the petrous part, which is the, the medial part. Of, of this bone and, and you can clearly understand that it's connected with all the bone of the skull, um, the parietal bone, the, the great wind of the spinoid, the occipital bone uh, and you see that uh, uh, in this bone practically you have a, a must of most of the most important structures in, in the in the skull base because from an inferior aspect you can see um, uh, the foramen for for the jugular vein for the carotid artery is an inferior view of the of the temporal bone um, from these pictures below you can see the articulation between the temporal bone with the occipital bone so the uh, relationship between the foramen magnum and the occipital bone and also with the greater wind of the sphenoid and the glenoid fossa what I think it's, it's much interesting, it's the superior view. So you can see, for example, the connection between the petrous part, so the medial part, to the foramen magnum, so the occipital condyle, the jugular tubercle, so the uh, condylar foramen, the clivus, and also the uh, foramen spinosum, middle meningeal artery, foramen ovales, and, um, and man, 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 uh, maxillary nerve, and foramen rotundo mandibular nerve. So, uh, and you can see also, uh, usually the, the, the tympanic bone is not considered as important as it really is, but the, the th tympanic bone, as uh, always Professor Sanna uh, says, it's uh, practically the gateway to the skull base, because if you remove this bone, you see here, this, that's the styloid process, you go directly towards the carotid artery, the jugular vein, and also the lower cranial nerves, as well as if you remove the uh, anterior part, uh, you are also connected with the temporal mandibular joint, but you are also connected to the horizontal and uh, to the vertical and then the horizontal portions of the uh, petrous internal carotid artery. So you see the tympanic bone, uh, uh, tympanos quamus suture line, tympanomastoid suture line, and the spine. These are the borders. You see this dotted line is practically the temporalis line, which is the landmark for the middle fossa dura plate. That's uh, a, a, an old picture. I will show you uh, a lot of uh, a, a late 90s um, dissection pictures, not because we are old fashioned, but uh, just because you can see that practically anatomy, uh, no, no one is uh, inventing nothing. So anatomy, if you know the anatomy, you can see endoscopic images, which are very beautiful, uh, as well as you can see all microscopic pictures. But what is important is, is to understand where the anatomical structures are and uh, independent from the quality and uh, the resolution of the picture. What is important is that you know where, how is anatomy because it's so much important and much more important than for, for the surgery. You see, that's the external rhetoric canal. So we are in the outer part of, of the ear. The uh, tympanic bone has been removed and you can see how many structures uh, are related to uh, the external rhetoric canal. This is very important if you have to deal with, for example, a squamous cell carcinoma of uh, the external rhetoric canal, both the bony and both even the, the skin, uh, two different types of uh, carcinomas, because one is a skin carcinoma, the other one is a skin and bony, uh, a carcinoma that involves both the skin and both the, the, the bone. So the behavior is different, but you know that how to deal with the um, related stru structures outside the, the ear canal, which is here. 
So you have the facial nerve, the extratemporal portion with the temporal facial uh, part and the cervical facial uh, part. This is the retromandibular vein, external carotid artery, superficial temporal artery and vein, auricular temporal nerve. You see that's the pointer and that's the mastoid tip. You see posterior belly of the gastric muscle and the uh, um, uh, gives you the direction uh, of the extratemporal portion of the facial nerve. So if you have to deal with the external auditory canal, you have to keep in mind that you have all of this around. Let's start with the middle ear. The relationship between the tympanic membrane and the most important structures of the, the temporal bone. You see, that's the, the tympanic membrane with the hanulus, which is the uh, strong attachment of the tympanic membrane to the sulcus of the external auditory canal. You know that anterior to the uh, external auditory canal, you have a temporomandibular joint. Inferiorly, you have the uh, hypotympanic area, but you see that the third portion of, of the facial nerve is coming into view because it turns horizontally in the stylomastoid foramen. And posteriorly, the, uh, you have the third portion of the facial nerve, medially, ossicles, and then the, the promontory. So you know how the tympanic membrane is related to the, um, uh, to the surrounding structures. You see, if you, if you elevate the tympanic membrane, you can see the ossicles in uh, all uh, their parts and the relationship between the malleus and the hincus, the chorea tympani, the promontory, the stapes with uh, the pyramidal eminence and the stapedial muscle. You can see here from this uh, enlarged uh, canaloplasty, as well as you can see after an endoscopic uh, articotomy and uh, visualization of the middle ear cleft, you see the posterior spine, the anterior buttress, the malleus, the hincus with the neck, with the head, all the um, ligaments of the ossicular chain uh, as well as the second portion of the facial nerve, the, the promontory. Practically, what you can see from the middle ear with the microscope is what you can see from the middle ear with the endoscope. Obviously, the quality could be different, but the anatomy is the same. Remove the hincus, and then you can see the cochlearyform process with the muscle of the malleus, with, with, is attached to the neck of the malleus. It's an important nerve mark as well of, of, of the pyramidal eminence for the facial nerve, because you see, that's the portion, portion the third portion of the facial nerve, which turns in, it, in its second genu towards the, the uh, mastoid, the, towards the tympanic portion. You see that both the lateral canal and the pyramidal eminence gives you the relationship between the second genu to the facial nerve. And then here, um, uh, the cochlearyform process and uh, the lateral semicircular canal for the tympanic part of, of the facial nerve. You can see it from a, a microscopic uh, view as well as from the endoscopic view. After an enlarged articotomy, you see here, the scutum practically um, uh, hide the, uh, the head, uh, the, the, um, the head of the malleus, as well as the short process and the body of the hincus. You see below a station tube, hypotympanic cells, round window, inferior retrotympanic area, uh, ponticulus, subiculum, pyramidal eminence, promontory. All of this anatomy has been perfectly described by, by Proctor. Uh, so, um, we have to, to thank endoscopic ear surgeons that uh, are prat have practically uh, renovated all the uh, concept about the middle ear anatomy, but uh, we have to thank Proctor before them to, for the description of all these spaces. Then you remove the malleus, you see the cog. The cog is a, a bony prominence from the middle fossa that divides the anterior attic from the posterior attic. You see that uh, below the cog, this the tympanic portion of the facial nerve, if you go straight, you have the uh, genic geniculate ganglion area. So the cog divides the anterior from the posterior attic, but also it's a, a protection for the geniculate, uh, the geniculate ganglion. You see the cochlearyform process, lateral canal, landmark for the facial nerve, as well as the pyramidal eminence, which is here in the lateral canal. You can see it from a microscopic view, as well from a, a, an endoscopic view. I, I won't go into details regarding simple middle ear surgery, so uh, meringoplasty or stape surgery, uh, grommets. I think it's something that is quite familiar for a, a, every ear surgeon, a, every resident 
I believe that uh, uh, if you want to be a, a, a real good uh, ear surgeon, you have to know perfectly the mastoid, first of all, because uh, usually a cholesteatoma is not just a simple cholesteatoma confined in the middle ear cleft. Usually the cholesteatoma extends in the mastoid, and usually the cholesteatoma is not associated uh, with no other pathology. So sometimes you have to deal with polyps in the mastoid, with inflammation in the, in the mastoid, with uh, uh, even uh, in, uh, granulation in the mastoid. So you, if you don't know the mastoid, how to treat the mastoid, you are not able to treat the cholesteatoma, even if uh, you are maybe able to remove a small congenital cholesteatoma through a, a transcanal or a poor endoscopic technique. So. I will go like a dissection and I will explain you how is important the techniques for being uh, not a, a, the best ear surgeon but all, almost a, a, good, a good ear surgeon. You know that if you start with the dissection, uh, the first step, well, you, you can explore the middle ear cleft and understand the relationship between the ossicles. Uh, the, the petrous portion of, of, of the temporal bone as well as the as well you, you can understand the relationship between the ossicles and the facial nerve but uh, uh, usually you start with with the mastoidectomy for the mastoidectomy the, the beginning is the triangle of attack so understand where to start in the middle fossa plate where to start in the posterior wall of the external auditory canal and where to start in the area corresponding to the sigmoid sinus so Middle fossa plate corresponds to the temporalis line, so practically the zygomatic process. It's the in, in, in conjunction of the, the uh, zygomatic process posteriorly. Then you can follow the posterior canal wall detaching the skin from the external auditory canal and doing a line that practically uh, continues the external auditory canal and then the conjunction between the line that you um, draw between the temporalis line and the mastoid tip is the area of the sigmoid sinus. So th that's the triangle of attack. As you can see in this picture, you see middle fossa dura plate, air of the sigmoid sinus and air of the posterior canal wall. After removing of the cortical bone, you can see that the corner septum, so the division between the cortical part and the um, uh, pneumatized cells. Uh, if you remove the pneumatized cells, you go inside the, the real mastoid, so the antrum, the posterior attic, and so on. And mm -hmm. that's the opening of, of the antrum. As you can see, that's the lateral semicircular canal, which is the practically the third landmark of your mastoidectomy. Uh, because the first one is the middle fossa dura, which is this one, the sigmoid sinus, which is this one, the sinodural angle, which is this one, and the posterior canal wall sh that should have to be thin, both in the dissection and both in surgery, both in the middle ear surgery, so cholesteatomas, and both in cochlear implant surgeries, because this posterior canal wall, if it's too, uh, if it's too, too big, so uh, practically, uh, and, uh, can put you in trouble uh, even for a, a posterior tympanotomy. So it's very important to thin to thin out this uh, this posterior canal wall. Then you open the antrum. You see this is the the short process of the hincus, which is also important because first it will give you the direction of your posterior tympanotomy if you do a, cochlear, a, a standard cochlear implant surgery as well it gives you the direction of the third portion of the facial nerve so cortical mastoidectomy pneumatized cells antrum posterior hatic short process of the hincus lateral semicircular canal the mastoidectomy should be at the same level both in the superior and both on its inferior part, that's the digastric ridge, which means it's the attachment of the posterior belly of the digastric muscle on the tip of the mastoid. This is another important landmark for the third portion of the facial nerve, because if you draw a line between the short process of the hincus and the digastric ridge, you understand where the third portion of the facial nerve runs. So it's very important if you have to do a posterior tympanotomy for a cochlear implant, as well if you have to deal with a posterior tympanotomy in a canal wall up tympanoplasty. If you find that the gastric ridge, uh, uh, this, mus this muscle muscular uh, attachment, you don't damage the facial nerve. 
you have not to pay you, you have not to be scared on finding the digastric ridge if you are in trouble in the finding of the facial nerve because that's just a muscular attachment the facial nerve at the tip of the mastoid turns horizontally towards the stylomastoid foramen so you if you find this posterior muscular attachment you don't you do not damage the facial nerve so if you are in trouble always find the digastric ridge because it's a, a good landmark to identify the facial nerve then once the facial nerve is skeletonized, you see the lateral semicircular canal could be clearly under your view. That's the posterior wall of the external artery canal. The medial bone between the facial nerve and the sigmoid sinus is the space where you can find the jugular bulb. Then you can see also the posterior, uh, the posterior semicircular canal, which crosses perpendicular the lateral semicircular canal. You see that the ampoule of the posterior semicircular canal it's the landmark for the facial nerve. If you find the posterior semicircular canal and the ampulla, don't go anterior, otherwise you damage the facial nerve. The jugular bulb is medial between the sigmoid sinus, the gastric ridge, and the third portion of the facial nerve. That's the, an enlarged view, uh, a close view of the, of the labyrinthine block. When you do the mastectomy, if you are in a closed technique, what you have to do especially if you have a cholesteatoma that even uncongenital, for example, cholesteatoma that goes in the anterior attic, it, it could happen. What you have to do is the haticotomy. So drilling between the middle fossa dura plate, that's the reason why you have always to find the middle fossa dura plate in your mastodectomy and the superior wall of the external artery canal. Between this space, you can drill all the bone, paying attention to the ossicles medially, because otherwise, if you touch the ossicles, you will have sensory nerve hearing loss. But you can open all the anterior attic till the supratubal recess. That's the anterior attic. You see, that's the head of the malleus. It's all the space uh, uh, superior to the station tube. Then you move to the posterior tympanotomy. Uh, which are the landmarks for the posterior tympanotomy? Short process of the hincus, facial nerve, a corda tympani. If you find the beginning of, of the corda tympani, you have a virtual triangle that could be drilled. And so you can drill all the space between these two landmarks, following the direction of the short process of the hincus. And you are in this way, you. Uh, you you don't have to be scared, neither for the facial nerve or the posterior wall of the external artery canal. One of the errors of the posterior tympanotomy, for example, in a cochlear implantation, is the damaging of the posterior wall of the external artery canal because you don't want to find the, the, the facial nerve as well as the coda tympani. Don't worry. Find the facial nerve, skeletonize the facial nerve, skeletonize the corda tympani. Obviously, you don't have to do all of this work for a cochlear implant, but if you drill in this space, you won't damage none of these structures as you, you arrive to the round window area. As you can see here, round window, a pyramidal eminence, so you have a landmark for the second genome of the facial nerve, stapedial muscle, and stape is here. Then, if you want to proceed with the uh, posterior tympanotomy inferiorly, and this is very important both in um, uh, cholesteatoma surgery, for example, if, if you have to treat a, a tympanomastoid paraganglioma, as well if you have to deal, for example, with a carcinoma of the external artery canal, so you have to perform an unblock excision of the external wall of the external artery canal. You have to go inferiorly. You cut the corda tympani. You know where the facial nerve is running. You see that the digastric ridge virtually is here. The facial nerve follows this direction and then it turns almost horizontally towards the stylomastoid foramen. If you drill here, you can follow the facial nerve and you can reach all the hypotympanic area. Eventually, you can go even below the facial nerve. So you can do a retrofacial tympanotomy. So you can manage the jugular bulb, retrofacial, and anterior to the facial nerve. There is a rule in otology, the jugular bulb lies two-thirds posterior and one-third anterior to the, to the facial nerve. This rule is not always uh, followed, but uh, you know that usually the, the position of the jugular bulb to the facial nerve, is, it's, it's this one. Then uh, you can remove the... Um, 
this facial, the facial, uh, this, uh, a small piece of bone that protects the short process of the hincus from the facial area, you can remove this, this buttress, and then you can see all the short process of the hincus, and you can see where the second portion of the facial nerve is going. This could be useful, for example, for the facial nerve decompression, even if we do not perform this uh, technique uh, uh, so much nowadays, it could be interesting in some cases. For example, if you have a facial nerve tumor involving the third portion of the facial nerve, you have to cut the, the nerve and do anastomosis between the, uh, the remnants of the facial nerve, the tympanic and the rest of the third portion. This, this could be a good exercise, trying to save the, the middle ear and try to save the hearing in, the, in these uh, patients. So, I show you what is practically a complete canal wall up mastoidectomy. But now let's focus on the indication of this technique. You know that the canal wall up mastoidectomy, the main indication is the cholesteatoma, especially in children with congenital cholesteatoma, or in case of cholesteatoma with highly pneumatized mastoids, so where a canal wall down technique could be uh, at least tricky. Um, obviously, you use a, a simple mastoidectomy with a posterior tympanotomy for cochlear implants, or in case of facial nerve decompression, or in case of a class B paraganglioma. We'll focus in some of these diseases just to show you how um, the dissections uh, could be uh, useful for uh, the management of the pathology. Well, we have a, 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 a rule here. Uh, usually, we do not follow the pathology. First of all, we uh, understand where are the landmarks, the anatomical landmarks, and we follow the anatomical landmarks, and then we follow the pathology. If you follow the pathology first, the risk is, is that you can damage the anatomical landmarks. So first of all, follow the anatomical landmarks. This is important both for uh, cholesteatomas and I think also for the cochlear implants. Doing a small mastoidectomy with a simple hole uh, is practically uh, as effective as doing a, a good mastoidectomy. If you do a good mastoidectomy wide, you understand where the facial nerve is, where the corda is, and you do a safe posterior tympanotomy, at the end the result is the same on doing a small, small, small hole just to insert the, the array, uh, where you can risk an opening of the posterior canal wall or as well as damage of the third portion of the facial nerve. You see, these are the steps that I show you uh, earlier. Uh, remember that uh, doing a canal plasty is very important to manage all the quadrants of the tympanic membrane. It's so important, especially in meringoplasty, and the endoscopic approaches uh, uh, sometimes could uh, uh, save this step, sometimes not, because uh, if you have an anterior perforation and you have to do a canal plasty, uh, do we do the, the procedure uh, transmiatal? could not be so effective and could not be so safe. So remember that the canal plasty is one of the most important steps for the middle ear surgery. And then you proceed both with the articotomy, here the incus is not, uh, is not present anymore, both the posterior tympanotomy, always keep in mind where the facial nerve runs. And you know because you know where, where is the lateral semicircular canal, you know where the corda tympani is, you, you knew where the incus uh, were, so you know where to perform the posterior tympanotomy. So in this way you can have complete control of the posterior mesotympanic area. Then you can do a, a combined approach, so from the middle ear cleft and from the posterior tympanotomy, using two hands, cotonoids and so on, you can remove all the pathology both in the middle ear, both in, in the mastoid, and even in hidden areas, if you have a, a deep mesotympanic, a deep sinus tympani, you can manage doing a good uh, um, posterior tympanotomy, and then if you want, you can even use uh, some new instruments, the endoscope, to check if, if you have pathology in, in that area, and then you reconstruct, you can use the silastic, you can reinforce the, the hatic, then you use the fascia to reconstruct the tympanic membrane, but these are the main steps. I just show you two cases of simple mastoidectomy. That's one case for, that's a, a congenital meningoencephalic herniation in the mastoid. You see the patient the, the, come to, to, to us just for headache and the pulsatile tinnitus. You see the hearing is practically normal. 
in the tympanic membrane nothing could be could be seen but sometimes you can have a unilateral effusion so always pay attention to unilateral effusion because it's not uh, uh, it's very rare that we have a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, but it's much more frequent, for example, a meningoencephalic herniation with uh, CSF leak. So always do a CT scan and always check even if there is a deficit in the Tegman tympani, in the Tegman antry, and check if there is uh, some brain inside the middle ear. In this case, the hearing was good. We did a simple mastectomy. You see that's the posterior canal wall. That's the middle fossa dura plate. If you have to deal with such pathology, you have to understand what the middle fossa plate is, not uncovering so much the middle fossa dura plate. Sorry, I removed the, the volume. You see, that's the brain inside the, the, um, the mastoid. Uh, this is not, not functioning brain, so you can remove it. But first of all, you have to understand where the haptic is and where the short process of the incus is. You see, this is the short process of the incus. You know that medial to the short process of the incus, you have the lateral semicircular canal. If you do not find the middle fossa dura plate and the sigmoid sinus, and you do a posterior haticotomy, the risk is that you can go directly inside the lateral semicircular canal or directly uh, towards the uh, short process of the incus. Once all the landmarks have been identified, you see where is the neck of the herniation, you start to, to coagulate, you remove the brain inside, you remove the brain inside, sorry, and then you can reconstruct the, um, and then you can reconstruct the tegment, then you coagulate and you can reconstruct the tegment with the, some cartilage and so on. But it, that's not to, to show you how to perform this, this uh, meningocephalic herniation removal, but just to show you how it's important know, to know where there is the middle fossa dura, the sigmoid sinus, the lateral canal, and the hincus. In this way, you can remove the pathology, preserving the hearing, and reconstructing the, um, the tegment tympani. Then here we obliterated the, the mastoid with fat, but the patient is well. You see the, the tegment is reconstructed. There is no meningocephalic herniation anymore, and most important, the patient preserved his hearing function. So that's a perfect uh, result. You see, that's another simple mastectomy. How to do the posterior tympanotomy? Short process of the incus, the facial nerve is here. The posterior canal wall is thinned down. The corda tympani is not uh, completely under, under view, but runs here. So if you drill between the facial nerve and the corda tympani here, you can open all the posterior tympanotomy as much uh, as you want, and all the round window area can be, could be uh, under control. You see, then you have to remove this limb, this uh, anterior superior limb of the round window area to check where exactly the membrane is. And then you can proceed with the implant fixation, removal of the round window membrane, and then insertion of, of the ray. But you, you see, we did not perform a, a, a so small mastoidectomy you have to identify where the middle fossa dura is and where the sigmoid sinus is. This gives you all the space to do a posterior tympanotomy. Maybe is not a novel concept because now the trend is to do minimally invasive mastoidectomies or techniques, but at the end, what is important is to put the implant inside safely. So if you are at the beginning, if you are young, take your time and follow the anatomical landmarks. In this way, you will do a good or perfect posterior tympanotomy. That's, for example, another case of cholestatoma. And now you will understand how it's important doing posterior tympanotomy and dichotomy to control all the cholestatoma in the mesotympanic and in the haptic. You see, posterior canal wall tint, middle fossa dura plate, sigmoid sinus, the cholestatoma fills, the antrum, the posterior haptic, that's the lateral semicircular canal. You see that cholestatoma goes anterior. What you have to do is to do the articotomy. So following the posterior superior canal wall at middle fossa dura, you have to do all of this space to get control of the haptic, reaching even the anterior haptic. So the space anterior to the head of the malleus. In a while you will see head of the malleus, incus, that's the anterior haptic, and you can see that cholestatoma is not going in, in that direction. Then you can open the tympanic membrane, that's the corda tympani. 
the cholestatoma fee, uh, fills the middle layer cleft and even the hypotympanic area. With two hands, you elevate the, uh, the cholestatoma sac when it, with, with its matrix upwards. We knew from the CT scan that cholestatoma went towards the mesotympanic area. We, we elevate a little bit more the cholestatoma with, it, with its matrix, mm. and then we proceed with the posterior tympanotomy. Just to be sure that we remove the cholestatoma not in pieces, but possibly in one single block. Then you see short process of the hincus, which is here. That's the lateral canal. So the facial nerve is between the lateral canal and the short process of the hincus. You can drill all of this space to get access to the mesotympanic area. And you see that practically all the hincus could be controlled. Long process here. You see we go through the middle ear cleft and through the posterior tympanotomy. Here is the area of the incudostapedial joint. We progressively detach the hincus and then, as I told you, with cotonoids combined approach, we try to remove the cholestatoma as possible in, 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 one, in, in one block. It's not always possible, but, but we try avoiding uh, cholestatoma remnants. Then you remove that bony spicula between the short process of the hincus and and the second genome of the facial nerve and, and, uh, and the and lateral semicircular canal, you see that the long process of the hingus is full of skin. This is the stapes which is eroded. What we did was to cut the long process of the hingus, which is full of skin. And then, obviously, in these cases, you have to perform a second stage, possibly retroricular approach. But you can also try transmihatal if you want. In this way, in this, is, in this second stage, you can at the same time reconstruct the hearing function, so rehabilitate the hearing and check for any cholestatoma uh, residual, which could be possible. And that's the reconstruction of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the tympanic membrane. But the kind of wall up mastoidectomy could be also important, for example, in paragangliomas. Paragangliomas are classified by in tympanomastoid and tympanojugular paragangliomas, class A, class A paraganglioma is a paraganglioma confined in the, um, in the tympanic cavity. A1 could be uh, controlled just with the otoscopy. A2 uh, cannot be controlled only by otoscopy. Class B, it's a tumor, B1, which goes in the hypotympanic area. Uh, B2, uh, middle ear with extension in the mastoid, which could be extension, for example, in the um, aditus or in the hantrum, or for example, in the retrofacial area. B3, it's a tumor that fills the middle ear cleft with an involvement, eventual, an eventual involvement of, on, of the mastoid, but most important, an uh, initial erosion of the carotid, which divides a, a B3, for example, for a C. Uh, so a tympanojugular paraganglioma. The jugular bulb is not invaded by the paraganglioma, as in a uh, class C paragangliomas, tympanojugular. For example, in a, in a class B1, you can do a canal wall up with a posterior tympanotomy. That's the case, you see. A paraganglioma in the mesotympanic and hypotympanic area, you do an, an extended posterior tympanotomy, that's the facial nerve, that's the lateral canal, that's the short process of the hincus. The short process of the hincus gives you the direction of the posterior tympanotomy. You open the tympanic membrane, sometimes you have to remove the whole tympanic membrane, put it in a, salinic, in, a, in a salinic solution, and then you can reposition the tympanic membrane in a overlay fashion. In this way, you can control all the middle ear cleft. And then uh, in a, a combined approach, so through the ear canal and through the posterior tympanotomy, you can progressively remove the paraganglioma. What is important is not only remove and, and coagulate, but also uh, drill the bone, especially the hypotympanic bone, where you have the feeding vessel to the paraganglioma. Otherwise, the risk is that you can have a, a recurrence after many years. That's our experience in paragangliomas. These are all the paragangliomas treated. I think we have maybe the, the, um, the largest series in, in the literature. 
But then let's go back to the dissection. We, we started with a, a canal wall up tympanoplasty, now we go to a canal wall down tympanoplasty, which essentially is the removal of the posterior canal wall. You see how is intimate the relationship between the posterior canal wall, which has been removed here. That's an old fashioned uh, picture, but is, it's effective because even if it's old, you can understand the anatomy. So you understand the relationship between the posterior canal wall and the third portion of the facial nerve. Uh, again, the lateral semicircular canal, the genu, with the pyramidal eminence, and then the tympanic portion of the facial nerve after the second genu. You can elevate or remove the tympanic membrane, and again, you can see the relationship with the ossicles, cochlariform process, round window, and, and so on. Which are the indications of a canal wall down mastectomy? Oh, obviously, cholesteatomas. If you have a cavity like this one, so very low middle fossa dura, far advanced sigmoid sinus, you see practically there is a virtual synodural angle. You cannot treat the cholesteatoma without removing the posterior canal wall. And then a transcanal approach cannot be uh, helpful because if you cannot control even this area, this small synodural angle, the risk that you can leave some pathology behind. So here you have to remove the posterior canal wall and do a canal wall down technique. Obviously, if you have a contracted mastoid, if you have a bilateral cholesteatoma, if you have uh, some syndromes like a cleft palate or, or Down syndrome, you have to do a canal wall down mastectomy. As well, in some cases of benign tumors involved in the middle ear, as well as some malignancies, you can do a canal wall down mastectomy. Which are the principles? The principles are the same of what I've told you at the beginning. First, follow the anatomical landmarks. So, middle fossa dura, sigmoid sinus, synodural angle. The cavity should have round margins. It, it should be a round-shaped cavity. Otherwise, if you leave angles, the risk is to, you, you could have a wet cavity, a cavity that does not uh, um, uh, repitalize, uh, and you have always problems. So round margins of the cavity, if you want to round margins, you have to follow the anatomical landmarks. Then you follow the pathology. Second, facial ridge. The facial ridge should be lower to the level of the lateral semicircular canal, which is this one. And the, the landmark for the facial ridge to low the facial ridge is the corda tympani. If you remove the corda tympani, if you find the beginning of the corda tympani, you know that posterior to it, you have the facial nerve, so you, have, you don't have to drill more. Then another key point is to drill parallel to the facial nerve in the, in the direction of the third portion of the facial nerve, because if you drill perpendicular to the facial nerve, you will damage the facial nerve. So again, annulus with the corda tympani gives you the, 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 the posterior aspect of the a facial reach. Then the depth is the lateral semicircular canal. In this way, you will have a perfect cavity without any problems. Then you can remove, for example, the head of the malleus so you can control all the attic, all the anterior attic. You see, that's the facial reach. It's practically at the level of the lateral semicircular canal. You can control all the stapes, all the round window removing the part of the ossicles and even hold the ossicles you can control all the attic and then obviously uh, it's not true that patient with a open cavity does not hear properly uh, i'm doing a prospective study on of um, uh, pediatric cholesteatoma and practically there is not such a big difference between canal wall up and canal wall down tympanoplasty. obviously the, the main the main point is the presence of the stapes if you have a, a stapes you can put a cartilage, you can put uh, an uh, artificial ossicle, you can put a molded hincus, you can have a good earring even in a canal wall down technique. So canal wall down, it is not uh, an old uh, uh, surgical concept and you have to deal with this technique because otherwise the patient should risk one, two, three, four, five surgeries before having someone that will do a canal wall down tympanoplasty and will solve the cholesterol problem. So then you can reconstruct, you can put a silastic, you can put a fascia, and, and then you can do a, a second stage uh, through a transcanal approach. 
why I, I, I posted the modified bonding canal wall down mastectomy? Just to tell you that that's a very, very good technique in case you have an anterior epitympanic cholesteatoma with good hearing. Sometimes you can have also a cholesteatoma that uh, involves the medial aspects of, of the ossicular chain. You can use this technique because practically in one stage, we, we did a modification of the classic Bondi mastectomy. Bondi did an enlarged aticotomy without removing the mastoid. We do a canal wall down mastectomy, leaving the ossicles in place. In this way, you can have in one single surgery preserving of the ossicular chain and removal of the cholesteatoma. And you have very, very few recurrence rates. Consider that if you have to deal with a recurrence in a canal wall down tympanoplasty, it means a uh, pearls in the cavity that you, that, that you can remove even in, the, in your office. Uh, it's not a real recurrence. That's an example of a modified canal uh, wall down mastectomy. You see that's an open technique. We are removing the posterior canal wall, which is this one. This is a cholesteatoma. It's not a simple an epitympanic. It's an epitympanic that involves even the uh, aditus and uh, the antrum. Then we do a canal plasty. And then we open the tympanic membrane to check if there is a conjunction between the hincus and the stapes. There is a, a, a conjunction between them, so we try to save them. You follow the middle fossa dura. In this way, you control all the hatic, not touching the ossicle, which are here. You see here the malleus, which is intact. That's the body of the hincus. You understand if there is some pathology in the anterior attic. In this case, we had some polyps. That's why I told you it's important to deal with mastoidectomy because it's not, always, it's not only a cholesteatoma usually. Then once all the cholesteatoma has been removed, you can reconstruct. You can put some cartilage below the ossicles. You can put a fascia with two limbs, one a, a lateral to the incudomalar joint and one posterior. And after that, uh, uh, you will have a perfect cavity with preserving of the hearing function. You see, that's the technique on how we reconstruct the cavity. We take a big temporalis fascia, and then you reposition the skin. You see here the tympanic membrane, it's practically normal, and then all the cavity will be uh, repitalized. And that's the endoscopic results, the endoscopic results in, in your office. You can see it's... Uh, a round shaped cavity, stable cavity, the earring is normal, and, and that's the miatoplasty. So there is someone who says that the miatoplasty is something that deals with the Hades. That's not true. If you do a good miatoplasty, it's not so, an, so anesthetic, but you can do a good canal wall down tympanoplasty, preserving the hearing and giving the patient in one single surgery a good result regarding the uh, removal of the pathology and preservation of the hearing function. So uh, we always remember that the canal wall down tympanoplasty and miatoplasty is not an old concept, but it's a real, it's a concept that you have to deal with if you want to be a middle ear surgeon. Then uh, I say about the techniques, but you also have to think about the results. So you see that practically the, the hair bone gap is minimal. And you see that if you deal with the, the residual cholesteatoma, 8.1%, but it means pearls, lateral to the tympanic membrane, that you can remove even in your office, so without putting the patient again in the OR. Then, some, some years ago, uh, we did a little, a brief revision of the literature comparing the results of the Bondi technique with uh, other papers that uh, uh, practically uh, um, uh, use it only uh, endoscopic, uh, pulling endoscopic or combined technique. As you can see, the recurrence rate is so uh, practically zero in, 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 our, in our series. But usually, if you deal with uh, other papers, there is never no mention of retraction pockets, of uh, earring function. So, if you want to, to, to um, uh, be innovative, you have also to deal with the results. So, uh, it's not just a question on how you see the surgery, how, 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 how beautiful are images and, and videos, but how your results are effective. So, uh, before saying that um, a technique is uh, hold, 
you have to propose a, a technique which is much better in terms of results. So that's why we did some some brief review. I'm not against uh, the endoscopic surgery, but uh, before saying that something is really new, you have to compare results. So this is very important to understand if what, if what you are doing is, uh, has been passed or, or not. And, and just again, some numbers regarding how, how many cholestatoma surgeries we, we did in our centers, nearly uh, 7,400 cases. So let's go back again with the dissection. So closed tympanoplasty, first of all, vision of the middle ear cleft, then closed tympanoplasty, then open tympanoplasty with uh, just a focus on modified bonding technique, now just shifting subtotal petrosectomy. What is a subtotal petrosectomy? Subtotal petrosectomy is uh, obliteration of the middle ear. So practically is a canal wall down tympanoplasty with removal of all the mastoid air cells uh, of the temporal bone removal of the circular chain and obliteration with the cavity with fat and closure of the external artery canal in a, in a blind sac uh, fashion, fashion. First, uh, we were in a left ear, now we move to a right ear. These are uh, newer images, so probably you, can, uh, you, you, you will understand much better the anatomy. But you see practically same concepts, incus, malleus, pyramidal eminence, a facial nerve, lateral canal, promontory, and, and, and so on. These are the steps. So you remove first, first you disarticulate the incudostapedial joint, then you disarticulate the incudomalular joint, then you remove the malleus. Before removing the malleus, you have to cut the, the, the tendon of the malleus. And in this way, you have a vision of the cavity. There, that's the cog. So, bony eminence, which divides the anterior hatic from the posterior hatic, and which usually below the cog, you, you have the uh, geniculate ganglion area. You see cochlearifrom process and lateral canal, tympanic segment of the facial nerve, pyramidal eminence, which is here, lateral semicircular canal, second gene of the facial nerve. So, the facial nerve, the tympanic segment, is between cochlearifrom process, pyramidal eminence, lateral semicircular canal. If you want, uh, it depends even on, on the extension of the pathology. If you um, if you want well, if you want to follow the, the classical concept of Hugo Fish, you have to remove all the pneumatized cells in the in the temporal bone. But it's not always uh, useful to do that because sometimes uh, you can even follow the pathology in in, in this case. But uh, uh, so it, it could be this could be enough. It's not essential to skeletonize the labyrinth like in this way, or the facial nerve like in this way, or the uh, the gastric ridge like in this way. But sometimes you can even remove all the the pneumatized cells, and you see, removing the pneumatized cells, you understand the relationship between the petrous internal carotid artery with the cochlea. You can clearly understand where is the jugular bulb two-thirds posterior to the facial nerve, one-third anterior to the facial nerve. You can understand the digastric reach. And you can understand removing the cog where the geniculate ganglion area is, so this one. So as I told you, the subtotal petrosectomy is an exenteration of all the mastoidal cells with or without removal of the otic capsule. Classically, is without removal of the otic capsule. If you remove the labyrinth, it's a translabyrinthine approach with closure of the external artery canal. If you remove the cochlea and the labyrinth and the, and the posterior labyrinth, it's a transotic approach. Obviously, the advantage is that you have uh, enhanced uh, visibility of, of the temporal bone and all of the most important structure of, of the temporal bone. You remove all the sources of the infection and you can seal the middle ear cleft. Uh, subtotal petrosectomy uh, has been expanded in, in its indication, and you know that in case you have canal wall down cavities with intractable inflammation, a multiple surgery in case of chronic otitis media with bad hearing, you can use the subtotal petrosectomy. In case you have large meningocephalic herniation or in case you have during surgery a, a CSF leak that could not be stopped, you can have the chance of obliterating the middle ear. And it has been, uh, it has been increasing even this technique, even in case of cochlear implantation. If you have ossification, if you have malformations, if you have... Uh, um, 
uh, difficult uh, anatomical landmarks, for example, a far advanced sigmoid sinus that impedes you to do a cart posterior tympanotomy, you can use even a subtotal petrosectomy. Or in case of temporal bone carcinoma, for example, in the case of lateral temporal bone resection or especially subtotal temporal bone resection, practically you do like a subtotal petrosectomy and you follow the carcinoma, uh, removing it as much as possible. The steps. First of all, you have to transect the external artery canal. You separate the skin from the cartilage. You revert the cartilage outside, refreshing the margins, and then you use stitches to close the external rear canal. Then you come back medially and you do a second layer, so cartilage to the subcutaneous tissues of the concha. In this way, you have a, a real good closure. So if you have CSF leak, it won't go outside the, the, the closure of the ear canal. So you see the second, the second layer of cartilage. And that's the cavity that uh, has to be uh, created. So middle fossa, sigmoid sinus, synodural angle, facial nerve, this is the digastric ridge, that's the middle ear cleft, that's the uh, practically the, the, the antrum. Then you do a posterior, a posterior canal, um, a canal wall down, tympanoplasty, you see how is lower the facial, the facial ridge. So to the level of the lateral semicircular canal, you have to see where is the uh, stapedial, uh, stapedial tendon and the stapes. And eventually you can do a labyrinthectomy, but this is a, a, a translab approach. Eventually, as I show you, I've shown you in the section, you can do a superficial re recessed tympanotomy, so for controlling the jugular bulb and to check where the carotid is. And at the end, you close the station tube with cartilage and periosteum, uh, eventually fibrin glue if you have CSF, and bone wax. And at the end, you put the abdominal fat. You see how it's important to maintain the muscle. At the end, you practically um, suture the temporalis muscle um, uh, with the retroricular um, uh, muscle. Then this is the second layer, which is also the temporalis muscle. This is the second layer um, of, uh, of the external retroricanal closure. If you then put stitches between here and there, Practically, you have a watertight closure. So if you have CSF, it won't go outside. If you leave the um, fat in contact with the skin uh, or with the subcutaneous uh, tissue, the risk is that the fat could be uh, infected or uh, much more problematic. You could have CSF outside, so all the muscle could be uh, could could be eroded or could be then then infected, uh, so then it would be so much problematic to close. So, but if you maintain the muscle, then you do watertight closure, and practically you won't have uh, any problem. That's for example, and that that's an example of, of a cholesterol treated by a subtotal petrosectomy. Again, we do not touch the the pathology unless we have not find the uh, before the middle fossa plate and the sigmoid sinus and the synodural angle then you can start to remove the pathology in this case you see all the middle fossa dura is practically uncovered and covered by the matrix which is gently removed with the dissector then you can coagulate with this special uh, bipolar the middle fossa dura in this way you don't have any problem with the cholestatum in the dura plate then we uh, enlarge the synodural angle, but here we are drilling a little bit uh, the, the labyrinth time block because there was a big uh, fistula in the lateral canal, so the earring was gone. Once the uh, labyrinth time block is completely clean, that is supposed to be is the subarquat artery. Then we go in the middle ear cleft, we peel the facial nerve, which is completely uh, uncovered, and then we clean all the pathology. You see this is the carotid artery, that's the station tube. Usually, we close the external artery canal at the beginning of the procedure. Here, it's at the end, but there you can see how you can uh, treat the external artery canal skin. You dissect from the cartilage, then you avert the skin, you cut the skin. In this way, the, the, the skin hedges would be, uh, would be, uh, would be freshened and, and the closure would be much better. And then you put absorbable stitches you don't have to remove these stitches, 
you will have a scar that uh, will uh, disappear in one or, or two months and then you see that that's the second layer we use the trigal cartilage we dissect a little bit from the, the conca and then we elevate superiorly and close with this subcutaneous tissue in this way you will have a watertight closure and for sure you won't have problems in CSF leakage outside the ear canal at the end you put bone wax and periosteum you can put bone wax then periosteum then again bone wax and use the fat to close the cavity that's for example paraganglioma I will go a little bit uh, um, I, I will run a little bit more because maybe my time is, is, is ending you see first of all always the landmarks anterior canal wall facial ridge hypotympanic area middle fossa dura sigmoid sinus and then we treat the pathology so first the landmarks and then the pathology that's the tympanic annulus it was a B3 paraganglioma, which means that it's a paraganglioma that goes towards the carotid artery. That's the stapes you see here. Once the tumor has been removed for the stapes, we use some cotonoids. Now you see the bleeding is the feeding vessel. You see the feeding artery, you coagulate, and then you remove in a piecemeal fashion. In this case, the tumor went uh, uh, in the retrofacial cells, so you have to deal also with the retrofacial tympanotomy. Here we're going to search for the jugular bulb to, to pay attention to the jugular bulb. And then again, you coagulate. And you have to read all the hypotympanic cells which, which, are, which are there. Then I will show you at the end the relationship between the hypotympanic cells and the promontory, which is here. Then retrofacial tympanotomy. And then you see from the retrofacial tympanotomy, you can manage the jugular bulb here and the jugular bulb there that's the jugular bulb which was free from the disease this was why we we, we call it type b paraganglioma then we drill the bone between the promontory the carotid artery and the jugular bulb the part the uh, anterior to the facial nerve remove the last piece of tumor that's you see the feed and another feeding artery of, of the paraganglioma. We coagulate the, the feeding artery and we try again to, um, to drill in this area to search for the carotid artery. And skip and then at the end, sorry, I just want to show you the, the area of, of the carotid, which is this one. We put some surgery cell, we obliterate the station tube. You see the hypotympanic cells when, where we drilled was there. But the promontory is preserved, so that the round window. Sometimes we also remove the stapes superstructures because stapes superstructure because we saw that sometimes the patient could have some vertigo. That's due to the effect of the fat that presses the the stapes. So if you want, you can also remove the stapes superstructure, and you won't risk any problem in the sensory neural hearing. Which are the indication of subtotal petrosectomy in cochlear implantation? If you have a, a cavity with cholestatoma, cornicotitis media, or osteoradionecrosis of previous canal wall down technique, in case of cochlear ossification, malformation, fracture of the temporal bone, revision cases, unfavorable anatomy, in these cases, it is better to do a subtotal petrosectomy and a simultaneous cochlear implantation. In case you have a, a wet cavity, so uh, a discharging cavity, or if you are not completely sure that the cholestatoma has been removed properly, you can also put a dummy electrode and then do a weight and scan of your disease and then do a second stage cochlear implantation after one year. Um, the dummy electrode would help you to uh, prevent any uh, ossification and it, it will be better to find the right way to insert the uh, array. We started, uh, uh, well, I have to say that Professor Sanna did the first subtotal petrosectomy with a cochlear implantation in 1987, so probably, and he was considered for uh, that technique like a crazy, a crazy surgeon, but at the end he was right. Uh, the first who published uh, regarding this technique was, uh, I think, he's singing in 1991. And you see, that's our first report. Uh, and uh, now we, are, we have at least 200 cases of subtotal petrosectomies uh, 
with cochlear implantations and you you, you can you, you know that it's a worldwide accepted technique uh, which could help you a lot i show you just uh, another surgical video to understand how is important the subtotal petrosectomy this is a basal turnosification you see again middle fossa dura facial ridge uh, that's the cochlearifrom process lateral canal second portion of the facial nerve that's the stapes, which is your main landmark to understand where should be the, the, the round window area, which is this one. And now you will see that we will start to remove first the fibrous tissue and, the, and then we, 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 we will try to drill in this area to find the, the round window. Obviously, with a standard cochlear implantation, cochlear implantation it won't be so easy to, um, uh, to find uh, the right hole to insert the array. Uh, with a subtotal petrosectomy, uh, you have all the space that you need to identify the area of, uh, of the round window, uh, to do the drill out and then to insert the, the, the implant. Now we are extremely drilling the, the facial ridge and um, to be sure that we have all the space uh, needed for, for the procedure. You know that uh, uh, the round window area is just inferior, inferior posterior to the area of the oval window. So we will drill in that area to find the right hole. You see there's some scar tissue over the, the, the round window area. Then we remove the scar tissue. The, the patient um, was a cochlear, I think was a cochlear otosclerosis. You see. That's the stapes. We try to, to drill here, and then we follow the, the basal turn anteriorly. It's important to try to follow the basal turn anteriorly if you don't find a, any hole, because if you go posterior or inferiorly, the risk is to open the internal auditory canal, because you, you really don't appreciate the depth of, of your drilling in, in these cases. But it's very important to have a comfortable uh, approach to understand where should be the entrance of your of your array again with the hook we remove some tissue in the hypotympanic cells that's the no round window that's the hypotympanic cells and then we proceed again stapes and that's the hair of the round window so we go from deep to the round window to the oval window anteriorly to follow the basal tone of the cochlea sooner or later something will be under under your view i skip a little bit you see that's the i think the uh, that's the cochlear lumen i think that's the rampa vestibularis on the tympanic uh, scala we enlarge a little bit the approach until uh, the entrance is sufficient and as you can see here after the drill out that's the rampa, the rampa vestibularis, I guess. That's the area of the stapes. That's the promontory. That's the rampa vestibularis. That's the ossified. Uh, the, this the other ossified part of the uh, round window. We obliterate the station tube with cartilage, and then you uh, with periosteum, and then we put the implant. Sometimes in such cases, even the membranous labyrinth should be a little bit uh, scared. You, you should have some 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 scar some scar tissue inside, so it's always important not to force too much the insertion. Otherwise, the risk is that the array could turn uh, around itself. But in this case, we were uh, almost lucky, and the array should be inserted completely. And then you put some some periosteum uh, to seal this uh, uh, this entrance. Okay, that's the insertion. Obviously, the uh, subtotal petrosectomy could be much more useful. For example, in a case of a charge syndrome, when you have a important malformation of of the middle here, and so the uh, finding of a uh, the, 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 mm, you, you have to do sometimes a cochleostomy because you have no round window, no oval window, no stapes. Like, for example, you see this case that's the facial nerve, which is completely uncovered. We uh, dissect some scar tissue around the facial nerve. You see there is no stapes. 
we know that under the second portion of the facial nerve, uh, this is uh, why it's important the uh, knowledge of the anatomy. That is the area of the, 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 of the round window. Obviously, if you have the CT scan, the pre-op CT scan, that could be helpful. So drilling little by little, you will find the, the cochleostomy and you can have a, a hole to insert the, the cochlear implant. Now we are putting some, again, some tissue in the in the station tube and once the cochleostomy has been performed, you can put the, the implant and that's the, the post-op. Again, I'm almost uh, uh, at the end of the presentation. Canal wall tympanic cavity, canal wall up, canal wall down, subtotal petrosectomy. Now we have to remove the labyrinth and the cochlea and see what is surrounding, which could be important because, for example, sometimes you can have cholesteatomas of pathologies that involves the labyrinth, that could involve the cochlea, so you have to know what is behind the cochlea, what there is behind the labyrinth. So the labyrinthectomy you always starts from the lateral semicircular canal, then the posterior canal you see it's perpendicular and perpendicular to the posterior semicircular canal you have the endolymphatic sac and duct. In a deeper plane you have the, super, the superior semicircular canal and you see the relationship between the middle fossa dura plate and the superior semicircular canal. So if you want to open the canal you have to find the middle fossa dura plate. Once uh, the canal has be, have been opened, you can uh, proceed with the uh, labyrinthectomy and see where the openings of the canals go inside the vestibule, which is here. This is the ampoule of the superior canal, which is an important landmark for the superior vestibular nerve and the facial nerve. This is the ampoule of the posterior canal. You see that a few millimeters anterior to the ampoule of the posterior canal, you have the third portion of the facial nerve. That's the beginning, that's the common cruise, but that's the beginning of the endolymphatic uh, uh, duct from the vestibule posterior to the to the to the, to the, to the, to the speedrush bone. You see the, the endolymphatic duct and then the endolymphatic sac. If you have uh, to uh, find the internal auditory canal, you have to cut the endolymphatic duct and sac and uh, uh, push the posterior fossa dura posteriorly, so retract the posterior fossa dura. In this way, you can start the labyrinthectomy, drilling the bone between the jugular bulb and what is supposed to be the inferior border of the uh, internal auditory canal, which is here. If you leave the ampoule of the posterior canal, of the posterior semicircular canal, you, you know where is the facial nerve, but you even know where is the lower portion of the internal auditory canal. If you drill all of this bone, then you will find the cochlear aqueduct, which is your landmark for the lower cranial nerves, and in particular for the ninth cranial nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve. This is the limit, the inferior limit. Then you move superior. The drilling should be in, in this case, you have a right ear, so it should be in a clockwise direction, following the posterior fossa dura, the synodural angle, and the middle fossa dura till you reach the superior aspect of the internal auditory canal. If you leave the ampulla of the superior canal wall, of the superior semicircular canal, you know where to drill, not damaging the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve. You see, this is a transapical skeletonization of the internal auditory canal, and then we move towards the landmarks. Ampulla of the superior canal, superior ampullary nerve. This is uh, the vestibule. The superior ampullary nerve guides you to the superior vestibular nerve. So, this is the horizontal crest which divides the superior vestibular nerve from the inferior vestibular nerve. Behind the superior medial to the superior vestibular nerve, you have the facial nerve. Medial to the inferior vestibular nerve, you have the cochlear nerve. So, we don't use the Bill's bar, which is the bony eminence between the superior vestibular nerve and the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve to identify the facial nerve because if you follow the Bill's bar sometimes you may risk to damage the facial nerve and you understand why. The labyrinthine segment is here. So that's the Bill's bar and that's the horizontal crest. We do not follow the Bill's bar anymore but we find the horizontal crest, we leave the ampulla 
of the superior or the lateral canal and then following the superior ampullary nerve we go to the superior vestibular nerve and then we preserve the facial nerve eventually you can and that's how is a trans labyrinthine approach with closure of the external artery canal if you want and that's a transotic approach you can remove even the cochlea starting from the area of the round window which is, to, is supposed to be here here that's the basal turn then oval window middle turn then a station tube a station tube a, a genu of the petrus carotid artery apical turn and you see basal turn middle turn apical turn basal corresponds to the round window middle to the oval window and apical gene of the carotid genicular ganglion area i'm sorry to say again if you know anatomy it's not important if you use the handloscope or if you use the microscope you can use even this old-fashioned uh, image late 90s this 2000 and, and uh, 2019 2019 at the end if you know the anatomy is practically the same what is important is know where you are going not what instrument you are using you see the cochlea practically has been completely removed and now you move to the petrus apex so i start with the temporal bone telling you that the temporal bone is connected to the sphenoid so you drill the petrus apex you go to the clivus if you drill all the bone below the cochlea below the facial nerve between the facial nerve and, and the carotid you drill both the petrus apex and you reach the the, the clivus you see here even the fallopian canal the, the inferior portion of the fallopian canal has been removed so all the petrus apex has, has been identified you see the jugular bulb one third anterior to the facial nerve two third posterior Geniculate ganglion, labyrinthine segment, this goes towards the in internal auditory canal portion of the, of the facial nerve and that's the greater superficial petrosal nerve. Why is it so important to know this anatomy? Because sometimes you may have a petrous bone cholesteratoma. What is a petrous bone cholesteratoma? It's a cholesteratoma which involves the petrous portion of the temporal bone, which means the the most important part of the temporal bone i mean the labyrinth uh, the posterior labyrinth and the cochlea there is a classification if you want to to study uh, the most frequent cholesteatomas are the supralabyrinthine and the massive cholesteatomas you see this is a patient from uh, israel he is 15 years old he had six previous tympanoplasties you see he had not a bad hearing but a cholesteratoma with uh, erosion of the basal turn of the cochlea with complete involvement of the labyrinth the superior canal and it goes towards the internal auditory meatus what we did was a transotic approach maybe it's something which is not familiar if you don't perform a skull based surgery but this is important to understand that uh, our anatomy is fundamental to treat the, this pathology. Now we are removing the labyrinth. That's the facial nerve, that's the middle fossa dura uncovered. The synodural angle is posteriorly based. Now we are removing all the labyrinthine block. This, the bone between the middle fossa dura and the remnant of the labyrinth. That's the facial nerve, third portion, genus, second portion, tympanic. You see that there is cholesteatoma that involves all the facial nerve. You see that the vestibule is completely in, involved by the disease. So irrespective of the hearing, we have to remove the vestibule. Otherwise, the risk is to leave the pathology inside. You can even remove the cochlea to uh, get access to the petrus apex. So we are practically skeletonizing completely the facial nerve because in this case, the problem is the facial nerve. The patient sooner or later will have a facial nerve palsy and if you have a facial palsy with the cholesteratoma, it means that the facial nerve is interrupted. So there's not so much to do then. In this case, the facial nerve was normal. So what we did was to decompress the facial nerve. Like in this case, you see third portion, genus, second portion, disease, the geniculate ganglion area. Everything filled by matrix. That's the cochlea open. 
Then we go towards the internal auditory canal. That's the internal auditory canal, and you see the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve, and that's the portion of the facial nerve which goes in the internal auditory meatus. You see that the cholesteatoma involves the facial nerve 360 degrees. If you don't do this job, you will leave the cholesteatoma inside, and sooner or later the patient will have at least a facial palsy that won't recover. You see that the cotonoid between the facial nerve, but it's not important how you treat the pathology, it's important how you know the anatomy, because if you follow the anatomy, you will be able to treat the pathology. You see, that's the middle fossa completely elevated, vitreous apex completely uh, removed, that's the internal vitreous canal, there is a, some CSF leak, and now we continue to peel the facial nerve until the facial nerve is completely cleaned by the, the, the matrix. Obviously, such a case should be uh, controlled for, for at least 10 years with a DWI MRI, and then you put, you put fat. That's an, an extension of a subtotal petrosectomy. Last two slides. Now you open the dura, you see the facial nerve, labyrinthine, genitocleic ganglion, internal auditory canal, superior vestibular nerve and inferior vestibular nerve reflected inferiorly, that's the cochlear nerve which was medial to the inferior vestibular nerve, and once you open the posterior fossa dura, you see how beautiful is the vision in the view inside. So trigeminal nerve, which is superior to the seventh cranial nerve, the sixth cranial nerve and its entrance in the Dorellos canal there, that's the clivus under the petrus ica. That's the lower cranial nerves, 9, 10, 12 below. And that's the basilar and the contralateral and ipsilateral vertebral arteries. So I, I think I, I'm uh, I finished. I hope you enjoyed all the presentation and I.